the library. Starring Gene Siskel and Roger Ebert. And produced by DBV Enterprises. Sponsored by Lego Toys. And now a word from our sponsor. Wood. Oh, well, now we're back at the library. Roger Ebert couldn't make it today. He's on vacation. So, we've decided to call in a few guests to review our book. Our first books will be Grendel by John Gardner. It's based on the story of Beowulf, where there's a monster who terrorizes the town until he meets up with Beowulf. Well, now let's introduce our first guest, an English teacher from here in Illinois, named Ron Jodell. can see the past, present, future, and read minds. This is a pretty scary guy. Now you know how they feel when they see you. I wasn't trying to scare them. I was just trying to keep them from overpopulation by eating one or two. Fiddlesticks. Fiddlesticks, that's what I said. Why not frighten them? Creature, I could tell you things. Glad. In this, our final scene, Grendel approaches the Mead Hall for a final showdown with Beowulf. <laughs> Mm 
Come on. Disney? 
I'm thinking no. Actually, it's by Upton Sinclair. Oh, then I'm sorry. I can't say as I've ever read it before. Yes. Well, it's about a young Lithuanian from Lithuania who comes to America with dreams of fortune and fame until he comes to the Chicago... Stockyards. Stockyards. And meets up with dreams of fortune and fame and... Whoops. His visions perish in a jungle of human suffering. And I understand that we have some clips to roll from this movie. Now, wait a minute. That's my line. I understand we have some clips to roll, so let's roll those clips. And whose show is this, anyway? In this scene, Jurgis Rudkis... <laughs> Jurgis Rudkis, the young immigrant, begins his job in the pickling room at one of Durham's factories. Excuse me, mister. Well, well, what, what's this pointy object here that, that we're supposed to be doing here? Uh, that's a knife. You're supposed to take the knife in your one hand, yeah. grab the pickle in the other hand, and just chop away. Oh, okay. Seems like a reasonable job. It's really dark in here and cold and damp. Yeah, it's pretty dark and cold. Um, you're a new guy, huh? Yes, I am. What's your name? The name's Jurgis Rodkiss. Jurgis Rodkiss? Yep. Hmm. Where are you from? Yeah. Uh, Lithuania. Lithuania, huh? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Oh, by the way, watch out for this uh, slimy green stuff on the floor. It's All right. It's the acid from these pickles here. Yeah. Last guy standing right there chopping that pickle. I mean, it's disgusting. It just ate through his uh, shoes, through his bones, and he just... Ugh. Gives me uh, shivers just thinking about it. Like you. Oh, my God. Oh, God, no! Oh, God! Later, Jurgis breaks his ankle. Later? <clears throat> Jurgis breaks his ankle and loses his job at the pickling room. Here, he starts a job at Durham's fertilizer plant. Excuse me, sir. W what are we doing what? here? Oh. Uh, we're shoveling fertilizer. This knife is useless? Yeah, I'm afraid so. Get rid of oh, it. Oh, okay. Use this shovel? Yeah, start just spreading the fertilizer. All right. You must be a new guy, huh? Yes, I am. What's your name? Jurgis Rootkiss. Jurgis Rootkiss. Yes. So where are you from, Julius? Uh, I'm from Lithuania. Yeah? yeah? How's it like out there? Well, it's nice warm weather, unlike here. Yeah, it's a little cold and dark. I always yeah. wanted to go to Lithuania myself. Hmm, you should sometime. Yeah. Well, it's a pretty good job, except yeah. for the cold and the dark. But, uh, well, working seven days a week for mm. three cents an hour for 14 hours a day, it's, it's not bad. The smell is rather bad down here, though. Don't worry about it. You'll be used to it after a little while. Well, what's this uh, fertilizer stuff made out of? You don't want to know. Ah, oh, come on, tell me anyway. Okay, I'm twisting my arm. All right. Oh well, that won't break the dust. Eventually, Jurgis loses. Eventually, Jurgis loses his job at the plant and becomes because employed at Durham's Killing Beds. Excuse me, sir. What, what are what? we doing here? Oh, we're uh, cutting up sides of beef. Uh-huh. Yeah. Ah, I'll need a knife. Yeah, it's good okay. to get rid of the shovel and pick oh. up. Oh. Yeah. Knife. Ah. Must be a new guy, huh? Ask yes, I am. Oh, yeah? What's your name? The name's Jogis uh. Bodkis. Yes? Yep. Where are you from? I'm from Lithuania. Uh. Yeah? Yeah, nice sounds place, like, though. Yeah, sounds like, yeah. Uh. Well, it's a little dark in here. Uh. Yeah. Cold, too. Yeah. But there's uh, oh, a lot of real big hazards you have to look uh, out for. Uh, that sounds like little holes. Don't don't get put your foot in there. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, the other time, whenever you see this yellow light that starts to glow, you know, uh, 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 this you. Uh, uh, yellow light. Oh uh, God! Uh, oh no! Uh, uh, Gotta cut loose out uh, from behind uh, everybody! Uh, Help! It's a cow! No! Oh my God! No! Oh. Put it away! Oh. Help! Help! No, this is a cow. The cow won't let me in. Let me out! What's going on out here? 
ends on a high note as Jurgis joins the Socialist Party dedicated toward increasing the power of the working man. We give it two thumbs up. Hold on a second. Throughout the story, Sinclair uses unflinching detail to shock the public into the realities of the meatpacking industry. So we give it two thumbs up. Although some of the themes were quite lengthy, the overall theme of social justice is evident as the strongest of men is weakened by the political machine. So we give it two thumbs up. I haven't said that yet. You will. How do you know? Because I read your script. <sighs> well, let's review what we've said. All right. We gave Grendel a total of one and a half thumbs up because of the well-plotted themes of the book. And as for The Jungle, we gave it two thumbs up because of the graphic illustrations to describe the terrors of the 20th century working class. Yeah, and, uh, well. well, I'm afraid that's all the time we have for At the Library. What do you think you're doing at my line? Isn't it obvious? I'm obviously hosting the show. This is my show. Get out of here. Go on. Wait a second. Which one of us has our own talk show here? You may stand around and watch you some your movies and talk show. show. It's not movies. It's libraries. It's books. Can't you see books? Can't you see books? Who cares? I'm the popular one. I have my popularity doesn't mean nothing. I had this a decent show going. Get out of here. I was interviewing Satan until I had to call the ear and steal a couple of his five monsters. And then some... Includes another episode of At the Library today. Thank you for your participation. I wouldn't talk. White ears. <laughs> How do you think I got my hair so gray? I use Johnson's baby powder. It does wonders for my hair. But wait, it can work on others too. It doesn't matter if you have light hair. It doesn't even matter if you have really dark hair. This thing does wonders for your hair. <laughs> Look what it did for us. It'll do the same for you. Johnson's baby powder. Just make sure you do that with the holes open. <laughs> Clean this mess up. That's a little bit better. Almost there. How about them sides? Ah. Please don't. Please don't.
conflict of the beginning of World War II. But most contend that it began with the German invasion of Poland on September 1st, 1939. The reasons for the beginning of the most costly and devastating war of all time fall into three different categories. Number one were the unsolved problems left in World War II. Number two was the rise of dictatorship which destroyed democracy in, these, in between different countries. And number three was the desire by, for, by Germany and Italy and Japan to have more territory, which they had lost in World War I. Among the unsolved problems, the key one was the Versailles Treaty. This document, along with many other individual peace treaties, forced Germany into ruin following World War I. Germany had to disarm and give up land, pay reparations, and admit guilt in starting World, the First World War. Then there was the flop of the League of Nations, because it had no way of enforcing its policies and stopping World Wars. In addition, the members of the League were too preoccupied with their own nation's problems to aid Germany when its own officers pleaded for help. Perhaps the biggest cause of the Second World War, though, was the economic problem of the world. All the countries needed money, so they tried to squeeze all the reparation money they could out of Germany, even though Germany had no economy of its own and it was broke and in the middle of a depression. Then there was also the view that the Axis powers and the, uh, the same as the Allies were unfairly controlling the world's market and wealth, so that various countries of the Axis powers couldn't sell their own goods. So Germany, Italy, and Japan looked to conquer some other lands to begin to prosper economically. Many of you would say the bombing of Pearl Harbor if asked, why did the U.S. enter World War II? In effect, you would only be partly correct. The U.S. was in the midst of the Great Depression. Jobs were scarce. The war became a job source. As America began to supply the Allies, the defense industry boomed. Tanks, planes, and ships began rolling off American assembly lines, and thousands of jobs were created. The U.S. was able to get out of the Depression. Another reason was that other American countries were openly declaring war on the Axis in the U.S. at a feeling of peer pressure. Also, there was the German use of U-boats, or submarines, to sink ships taking cargo to the Allied powers. Then, when Japan declared war on China, most Americans sympathized with the Chinese and eventually quit trading with Japan. From there, Japanese relations became worse. On the fall of 1941, the leader of the extremist Japanese military group took control of Japan and started planning war against the U.S. And we all know that their plan was the attack on Pearl Harbor. Gee, Pearl Harbor. That reminds me of my trip to Africa so many years ago. I remember it as though oh, it were yesterday. And while, and while Joe here relates his tale to me, jungle, let's hear how Captain Matsuyo Kishido of the Imperial Japanese Navy relates his view of how he led the air strike against Pearl Harbor. And there were five bulkish ships there. Here's Captain Mutsuyo Fuchido of the Imperial Japanese Navy, the one who led the airstrike on Pearl Harbor. Hi. Hello. Hey. Planning for the attack on Pearl Harbor began in September of 1941, about three months before the attack was to take place. In early November, we learned that by adding more fins to the torpedo, we could use it in shallow water. By November 26, the 32 ship fleet, consisting of six carriers, two battleships, two heavy air heavy cruisers, one light cruiser, nine destroyers, three submarines, and nine tankers, began the 1,000 mile trek towards Pearl Harbor, and by December 7, the fleet was in position. It was 6.15 a.m., December 8, 1941, when the first wave of 183 attack aircraft were in the air heading to South Oyo Island. It was 7.30 a.m. when we saw the first sign of land, Kahuko Point, and we began to plan for the first strike. Two sets of plans had been derived for the attack. One, if surprise had been held on our side, or if surprise wasn't held. 
I decided that surprise had been still held, so I fired the first the signal for one shot for the first plan. But the fighters who didn't see the first shot caused me to fire a second shot, which confused the other pilots upon which tack we should be using. Supposedly, the attack we were supposed to use was the torpedo planes would go in first, followed by level bombers, and then the dive bombers would attack the airfield. This would cut down on the smoke so it was not to interfere with the sighting for the torpedoes and bombs. Instead, following the miscue, dive bombers took out the airfield to prevent the American pilots from getting up and encountering them in the air. This led to disorientation in the attack by our torpedo plane, but it wasn't destructive enough. Each group made two passes over our own targets, primarily the eight battleships. By the end of our first wave, four battleships were either sunk or listing badly. Two more were on fire. Only the battleship Pennsylvania remained unscathed because it was in dry dock. Here, the first wave, excluding myself, turned back, and at 8.55 a.m., the second wave descended on Pearl Harbor. The second wave concentrated its firepower on the battleships that had suffered little damage in the first wave and upon various destroyers and cruisers still left. But they faced heavier anti-aircraft fire. In the final report to the Japanese High Command, it was reported that at least four battleships had definitely sunk, as well as various smaller ships, and at least one half the island's air strength had been destroyed. Admiral Nagumo, fleet commander, had four reasons for not launching a third strike. Wang Chong Kwai, Chia Wat, Chia Chia, Chia Nia Chia Ying Kwai, Chia Ying Kong, Kwa Chia Chia, 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 Kwa Two factors helped prevent the entire destruction of the U.S. fleet. One was that all the carriers had been out on maneuvers and been away from Pearl Harbor when the attack was made. The other was the quick reaction of the United States gunners against Japanese attack. The heavy anti-aircraft artillery sent up by the U.S. on the first two waves helped prevent the Japanese fleet commander from sending off a third strike. Given that with this compliment, many of our men who fought the Japs from the boat said that we could have done better. The training was somewhat insufficient. Although they were insistently drilled, they weren't prepared for repelling the Japanese flying. What was worse, though, was the equipment. There wasn't enough anti-aircraft guns on board the battleships, and those that were there were outdated and not up to par to face the Japanese attack, being that all, had been built bef all the ships had been built before World War I. After the attack, all five of the battleships which had been raised, of the seven which were sunk, were modernized. Those five, in addition to the Pennsylvania, which had been in dried darn, can sustain no damage. Here in the picture, you can see what it was like, bef what the ships were like before World War One, and then what they were like after World War One. So the natives were left behind, and naturally, I fled the scene and escaped the next day. Sure, it was something which required great skill, and the average man would have surely been history, but that's the kind of great person I am. So, would you like to hear about my escapades in South America? Well, actually, no, Joe. We, uh, had other things in mind. Uh... Whoa, 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 what the... What? Oh, oh, I'm, uh, sorry about that. Mm.
That was a really great story there, Joe, but, um, I hate to say, but we sort of do have to get Ms. Malone. Um, of course. Anyway, continuing on with our documentary. It is believed by many that Midway was the turning point in the Pacific Theater. This two-day battle was the first deci decisive victory for the United States. Due to the great effort put forth by the United States Intelligence Office, we were able to break the Japanese code and learn of the plan to attack Midway. This would enable them to be on the back door of Hawaii and very possibly would have allowed them to win the war. Thus, from June 4th to June 16th of 1942, the U.S. made a brilliant attack which crippled the Japanese throughout the rest of the war. As the Japanese moved to Midway Island, planes launched from three U.S. carriers, the Enterprise, the Hornet, and the Yorktown, attacked the Japanese carriers and planes over a period of two days. At the end of the two days, the Japanese had lost four carriers, one heavy cruiser, and a very big portion of their air force. The United States, though, had only suffered the loss of one carrier, the Yorktown, and the destroyer the Hammond, the enemy submarine. One of the most famous campaigns in the war was the attack on Normandy, France. If the Allies could capture Normandy, they would have a base with which they could attack Germany. Normandy was a necessity because it would be a European holding and a way to defeat Germany. The campaign was the largest amphibious operation ever in the history of warfare. One of the most important parts of it, however, was the elaborate deception that contributed greatly to its success. The idea behind Fortitude, the name of the deception plan, was constructed in several parts. Both sides knew that there were only two possible places for such an attack, Bas de Galais and Normandy. The Bas de Galais site was by far the better site. The Allies wanted Germany to think that this would be the site and that they could not possibly make the landing before late July. They built cardboard, canvas, and wooden models of everything needed for a large-scale invasion. They leaked information to German spies and allowed reconnaissance planes to fly over the paper army site. Historians have blamed Germany for ignoring the obvious illusions set up by the Allies. Why did recon planes face no resistance until they had already gotten extensive photographs of the invasion force? Why did the Allies not attempt to mask their vehicles or maintain radio silence in the deployment site? Why had the British allowed letters complaining of large troop movements to be published? It was as if the Allies were asking the Germans to prepare for an assault. Whatever the reason for German belief in these elaborate but obvious attempts at deception, the Allied plan worked. The troops landed and met only minimal resistance. Even after the landing, the Germans were so reluctant to move their troops to Normandy for fear of the paper army attack. Fortitude was a complete success, and because of it, the Normandy campaign succeeded. World War II came to a final closing when the dropping of the first two ever seen atomic bombs in, in the world. These were the results of the $2 billion Manhattan Project, which had been started in the late 1930s or early 1940s. The bombs were ready by July 16, 1944, and were dropped on August 6 and August 9, 1945. The sites were Hiroshima and Nagasaki. On August 10, the day after the bombing of Nagasaki, Japan opened peace negotiations with the Allies. On August 14, 1945, Japan accepted the Allies' surrender terms and signed them on, August, on September 2. By September 8, all the Japanese forces had withdrawn to Japan. copy of the official document signed by the Japanese signifying their surrender. It was taking place aboard the USS Missouri.
This is Joe, and we're saying goodbye, and enjoy the rest of class. WPBM Channel 2 in Chicago presents The Donahue Show. Hi, I'm Phil Donahue and welcome to The Donahue Show. Today's guest is the author of the famous religion textbook, In His Life. Will you please give a hearty welcome to the Reverend William A. Anderson. Anyone else in the audience have any opinions? 
And how about you, young man? What do you have to say? I have to say that he was both man and God, simply because on earth he performed miracles. Miracles? What? He was part of the Trinity. Part of the Trinity? Yes. That sounds good. A good point of view. One says he was man, one says he was God, and now one says he was man and God. Confusing, I'm puzzling like, I'm me. Like, I'm like, I'm like. Thank you, young man. Oh. Whew. Dead man. Well, Will, interesting point of view, don't you think? One said that Jesus was God and man. One said that Jesus was just God, and one, you, said he was just man. What's your opinion on this? I plead the fifth. You plead the fifth? Yes. Okay. Well, here's our next question for you. Okay. How did the disciples, Jesus' followers, view Jesus? Well, that's an easy one, uh, Phil. Well, they say he had long brown hair that flowed well about the length of his back. He had a long beard, long mustache. He wore uh, robes, white robes, generally in the daytime, very plain white robes. And he had teachings that were very contradictory to the times, and he, and he performed witchcraft. All in all, they'd have to, I'd have to say that they felt that um, he was a, a, psycho, a psychopath that should be locked up. So you say that Jesus was viewed by his disciples as a lunatic with a bushy beard that should be locked up. Well, not a bushy beard, but a long beard. That sounds very interesting, Phil. Yeah, he had straight uh, Anyone in the audience have any opinion? Anybody? Me. You, not sir. Not those kids again. Pardon? I said not the kids. Don't go to the audience. Okay, well, anyone in the audience? Anyone? Me. Down here. Oh, you in the back. Phil, I hate you exactly. Yes, you young man. Yes. What do you have to say? How did the disciples view Jesus? They simply, they view Jesus as a loving, compassionate amigo. So they the thought, Messiah. They thought that Jesus was just a friend and a savior as opposed to a person with a bushy brown beard with long flowing white robes? Yes, that is right. What he said was ludicrous, simply stupid. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Well, Reverend, seems as though you struck out again. My next question is going to deal with the miracles of God. How do Jesus' miracles, the many he performed, affect us today? Well, look at the mess, 69 mess I'm talking about. I mean, a bunch of losers. Did they or did they not win the World Series? That was a miracle. And then all the, the predictions about the crying of down, a statue that cried tears. No! What? No! no. What is that? Hey, hey, hey. Somebody, probably 
he told me this from above, where um, it said, everybody with the first name Williams and the last name Anderson, I want you to join the seminary and become a priest. I'm calling you right now. And that was the calling that I got from God, and as you see today, I'm a priest. Hmm? Oh yeah, okay, that's great. Yeah. Anyone in the audience have a, have a comment? Is that yeah. what I just yeah. said? I do. Yes, you, sir. You, sir. How are we called the Holy Ghost? Well, it is through the Holy Spirit that God called us to holiness. So, the Holy Spirit calls us to holiness, and not the bulletin? That is correct. Nice going, I Will. I just use that. The bulletin does yeah, well. Well, Will. Well, our next question deals with Jesus' love. How did Jesus show his love for others? Uh, Will. Hey, Will. Uh, anyone in the audience? How did Jesus show his love for others? Uh, okay. Where'd you go? I had to go to the washroom. The second highest duty calls, I guess. First. Okay. How did Jesus show his love for others? Well, yeah, as many to his actions, you know, he expressed it. Well, the people he hung around with. Prostitutes, hookers, I mean, like, um, Mary Magdalene, for instance. I mean, prostitutes. I mean, just tell me. What would you feed your Jesus Christ and a, a prostitute would do together? He expressed his love through his actions. I mean, simple as that. Sounds good. Anyone in the audience? Have any? Nope. Yes, sir. Hey there, Donnie. How's it going? Yeah, no. Um, How did Jesus show his love for us? By becoming of the human nature of Bill, nothing else and nothing less. So, he became part of the human nature, and uh, thus he showed his love for human rights. That is correct, Bill. Okay. Great talking to you, Donnie. Right. You. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we have time for one more question. Our last question is, what does Genesis say about sin? I don't know. I don't remember the whole column of Genesis making any thoughts about sin. So, Genesis hasn't come out with anything good lately, so you don't know. Not unless you've gotten into your uh, recording studio. Okay, okay, let's turn this one to the audience again. Anyone in the audience have anything? Hello? Anybody? Hello? Right there, I see it, sir. Yes, yes. The uh, early, early stories of the book of Genesis, following it upon this sin, share the message right. that sin gradually gained a grip on the world. Uh, all right, stop it. That's what just the last book I ever wrote. Oh, oh, okay, okay, okay. So you said that uh, sin gradually gained a grip on the world in the book of Genesis. I'm yes. never doing any done on your show. I'm never, never doing it on show. Well. Security. 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 Well, Reverend, it's been great having you on the show. It was? Oh. Even though most of the yeah, things you right. said were uh, wrong, mm -hmm. we'd still like to thank you very much. Uh, you've been a great help, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to see you again. Thanks a lot. <gasps> <laughs> oh. <laughs> well. Okay, uh, that was the Reverend, the good Reverend. And, uh, well, that's about all the time we have for our show today. And uh, I'd like to thank all of you in the audience and just remind you that just some new facts and giving you some new insights about life. And just remember to keep these insights and by hearing comments from famous people and even people that you don't know, everything will get that much better for you. 
and I am Phil Donahue, and see you tomorrow. The Phil Donahue Show is a production of Channel 2. Any reproduction, retransmission, or other use of the description of the content of the show without the express written consent of the Chicago station is prohibited. The views expressed on this show are not necessarily those of the station. Thank you very much.